what do you think are the most important daily habits for overall health and longevity? You know, those are two really packed questions. I'll try to peel them apart a little bit and try to figure out where they come together. In other words, if you want to be healthy and live long, what are some of the things that are important on a daily level? Well, you know, I will tell you, physical movement is probably one of the most important things. We all spend way too much time sitting on our butts, doing important things, you know, in, in front of a screen. But in fact, the old school way of getting up and walking is absolutely critical. And the reason it's important is because walking improves your circulation, which is critical for the health of our organs. When you sit, blood has to be pumped by your heart, kind of like a pump on your, in an aquarium, you know, like a, your goldfish bowl or aquarium in your house. It, it's a lot of work. You know, you got to put that thing through the filter. But actually, if you think about the living sea, goldfish don't live in the sea, but if you have marine fish, for example, the currents actually move back and forth. And that movement is actually really, really important for overall uh, health. So that's one thing, physical activity. And by the way, you don't need to hire a trainer, buy super expensive workout equipment, just even starting by walking 30 minutes a day, walking briskly, like you're, you know, trying to catch a train or trying to catch a bus. That's kind of the thing that I'm talking about. Put on a pair of headphones, put on your favorite podcast, which we know what yours is and go, you know, and I think that's a good way to do it. Number two, I would actually say, you know, and this is something that a lot of people don't realize is staying hydrated. We lose water from our bodies more than just peeing it out. We lose water through insensible losses, meaning you can't really measure it very easily. Our sweat, our breath. Listen, if you snore at night, you're losing even more fluid by that. But just even existing, like water evaporates up. If you live in a warm area, you're going to be losing even more. That's the kind of invisible fluid loss that we don't realize. But guess what? Staying hydrated is not only good for your cardiovascular system, which we need to stick around and for a long time and be strong. But it's also really important for our kidneys. Our kidneys need to be well watered because every kidney, your left kidney, your right kidney is a filter, but it's a filter made with lots of little tiny filters. And each kidney, we got two of them, has 500,000 filters. These are little mini filters made with blood vessels. And you actually need to run fluid through it in order to be able to keep it well flushed and working. So think about it like in your house, if you don't run the water in your drain, you don't flush a toilet every now and then, the pipes dry out. And that's not what you want to have in your kidneys as well. So I would say something that a lot of people miss is really staying really, really well hydrated. So people say, should I drink 10 cups of water a day or 15 or whatever the quote recommendation is? I'll tell you as a scientist and as a physician, don't worry about those numbers. Just listen to your own body. If you feel thirsty, you should be drinking. And if you're going to drink, drink water, not soda, because the, the you know soda's got all those calories or artificial sweeteners that are going to damage your gut microbiome. So water is a really good choice. Coffee or tea? Hey, listen, I got a cup of espresso right here. Coffee, good for the health, good for longevity, good for metabolism. That's another way to contribute to staying hydrated and some people say, well, isn't coffee a diuretic? Doesn't it actually make you lose water because it makes you pee more, right? I mean, I believed that for a long time. When I was in medical school, I was drinking a lot of coffee just to stay awake when I was on call. And you would think that it actually makes you go to the bathroom. But studies have shown that if you drink less than 10 cups of coffee a day, you're not going to be losing water actually stays about even. So you, you get water from drinking a cup of coffee as well. So that's the second thing. You know, I would say the other thing for everyday health is not to eat too much. We eat way too much more than we need to. And so I say eat slowly, savor your food. So make sure you're eating something that you truly enjoy, not wolfing down, but really enjoy. Make it plant-based if you can. All right. And people go, you know what? I'm done with the salad bar. But there are so many plant-based foods that are absolutely delicious. Go ahead and, and look them up online. Delicious plant-based food, Mediterranean. Do a search and see if that's something you'd like to eat. But don't eat too much of it. That's the key thing. Do not eat too much. In fact, it's much better, much healthier. If you want to live long and prosper, as the Vulcans say, what you want to do is you want to actually even skip 
a meal or two or maybe even three a week, your body's going to be just fine. And in fact, it's going to thank you by uh, helping you become more efficient. One way it becomes more efficient when you miss a meal, which is basically the same as intermittently fasting. If you miss breakfast, you're extending your fasting from bedtime. If you miss lunch, you're creating a fasting window between breakfast and dinner. All right. And if you only eat one meal a day, man, you are extending your fasting big time from the evening until dinner the next day. Just don't overeat when you eat. Remember what I'm telling you. But one thing that happens that is really important, and you probably heard about this now, is something called autophagy. So when you fast, your body gets the instructions to clean out old, useless, and dying cells. It just basically does some spring cleaning. And you know how good it feels when you actually clean up your garage or clean up your kitchen or clean up your bedroom or whatever it is you need to, or your office. Uh, when you do that cleaning, it just feels a lot better afterwards. And so that's actually another little trick for lifelong health, but also living long. And speaking of intermittent fasting, I think a lot of times people, when they eat their first meal or eating their food in general, they don't know what to eat. There's so much talk about what to eat for breakfast. They're say, eat steak and eggs, eat bacon and eggs, eat oatmeal, don't eat oatmeal, eat this, not that. Based on the science and your research and your career as a physician, like what are the best options food wise for a healthy breakfast? Let me tell you what I do, because maybe that is the most telling because I, I, I sort of like to practice what I preach. First of all, because I'm a busy guy and my schedule is sometimes really, really densely packed, I sometimes wind up skipping breakfast. Yeah, do I get a little hungry? Yeah, but you know, before I'm so absorbed with what I'm doing, before I know it, it's lunchtime. So you can skip, all right? So one good thing to eat for breakfast is nothing, all right? <laughs> so let, let's start with that. Now, when I do eat breakfast, what are the things that I like to eat? You know, first of all, I eat very, very lightly. So how do I build up what I'm gonna do? Well, I never go without a cup of coffee in the morning, all right? And if somebody offers me a cup of coffee, I never turn them down. Coffee is liquid, and by itself, it's it's kind of nutrient-dense because it's got bioactives like chlorogenic acid, even has a little bit of dietary fiber, depending on how you make your coffee, and it's good for your metabolism. And it actually is good for your circulation and your stem cells in your body as well. So you're renewing yourself just with this liquid, all right? Coffee better than orange juice. I don't do orange juice. Orange juice, tall glass of orange juice made with the equivalent of eight oranges for a tall glass. That's a lot of sugar, a lot of fructose, fruit sugars to put in there. True, you do get the dietary fiber and you get other bioactives, but that's actually where you get a ton of sugar. So coffee, either nothing or coffee. And then what do I build on top of the coffee? I like to eat some fruit, seasonal fruits in the summer. If I have a nice, juicy, ripe peach, I'll slice it up, just one peach, and I'll eat those slices. That's great. Um, if I wanted to have something, and I'll tell you, I was doing some research in the Mediterranean this summer, I made myself a Greek yogurt every single day. Not a lot, not a big honking, it's not like an ice cream sundae bowl, all right? I had a, a little cup kind of thing. I put two big spoonfuls of yogurt, whole fat yogurt, that's been proven to be a probiotic that actually lowers your cholesterol, actually lowers the risk of heart disease, doesn't raise it because it's good for your gut microbiome, which is good for your heart. And what I do, because I, you know, I never get pre-sweetened with fruit or anything, jelly and nothing. I like the plain yogurt, which is how they eat it in the Mediterranean. I took fresh fruits, cut them up, sprinkled the fr fresh fruits on top. I'm putting the fruits down. I know what's in there. It's whole, fresh, seasonal fruits. And then and then I took some nuts, like tree nuts, like pistachios, crushed them up, sprinkled them on top. Now I got the nutrient-dense seasonal fruits. Now I've got some dietary fiber from the tree nuts and healthy fats. You get what I'm going here. And then, of course, then if you want a little bit of sweetness to it, which is totally okay, more than the fruit, I found, for example, in the Mediterranean, I happened to be in Greece when I was doing this research, take some organic honey, not, you know, the plastic bottle you're squeezing on. They just a little spoonful and just drizzle a little bit on top just for a little bit of sweetness. Okay. Honey actually has got bioactives as well that are antibacterial, anti 
They're like the bees antibiotics. Also kind of good for your mouth and your throat and coat your throat as well. So again, I will build a breakfast like that if I can, or I'll just have the fruit and I'll have the coffee. I tend not to eat carbs very much in the morning. And I don't eat breakfast meats. You know, I try to stay away from the bacon and the sausage. I mean, I don't try to. I definitely do. That's not a choice that I'll actually make myself. What about eggs? I don't a eat eggs a lot, but I do like eggs. Eggs are a great source of protein. And if you get good quality eggs, like, you know, eggs that come from healthy hens, healthy mom, healthy baby, same deal with eggs, healthy hen, healthy eggs. And especially if you get like a free range hen that is eating what it's supposed to eat. You know, you might be surprised the egg when you crack it open, that yolk is not bright yellow. But in fact, it's like this dark orangish red, like a blood moon. Beautiful. And that's because it's loaded with carotenoids. And the carotenoids that I would suggest somebody who's interested in healthy aging looks for are lutein and zeaxanthin. That's what makes that egg yolk orange. The more orange, the better it is. Lutein and zeaxanthin has been studied by the National Eye Institute in the United States, the epicenter for research on eye health, to decrease the risk of vision loss. Keeps your sight better. Now, if you had to lose a sense, one of your five senses, for example, the last thing I think I would want to lose is my vision. So I'm glad whenever I eat an egg, I get some protein and I get some of these carotenoids as well. You know, we, and we've talked about like foods that can help repair the metabolism. And I know it's not as simple as just like eating a food and then all of a sudden you're going to lose 20 pounds. But I know you've studied some foods that can help speed up the fat burning process. I'd love to hear more about those. This was an area of research that I wrote into my book, Eat to Beat Your Diet. Not a diet book. It's a book that, you know, I wrote based on my research on how do you not need to go on a diet for metabolic health. Right. Because at the end of the day, that's what we want. We want our metabolism to be as healthy as possible. Sure. Vanity is important. You don't want to look the way you don't want to look. And, you know, we all take a shower in the morning and every single one of us, anybody watching this or listening to this knows this. You step out of the shower, you're toweling yourself dry and out of the corner of your eye, you look at the mirror and you might see a lump or a bump that you didn't want to have there. And immediately you start kind of criticizing yourself Then you step on the scale. And that number that comes up in the scale is not the number you were hoping for. All right. Now, all of a sudden, like you've got this negative self evaluation. It's a self criticism. So what I tell people is that this, and then you go like, oh, I've got to eat less. I got to work out more. Okay. I want people to understand that the research actually shows that it's possible to eat foods, put food in your body that it will actually help you lose weight. And it's not just simply losing weight because body weight is kind of, it's a tricky number. Let's say you step on a scale and it says 200. You know, some of that 200 is just the weight of water in your body. And if you're a big guy or gal, you're going to have a large frame. You're going to actually have more water. And some of it's bone. And some people have heavier bones, bigger bones than other people, right? So that's your body frame. And some of it is muscle. Very, very important right? You want to keep that muscle to be able to have strength at any age, but especially as you get older. And then you've got body fat. And body fat is compartmentalized, right? It's, it's sort of like, if you think about the compartments in your car, if it's not something you threw, you know, in the passenger seat or in the back seat, might be in your trunk, if you have trunk space in the front, or it might be in the boot, as they say in England, in your back, right? So where is that body fat that you are actually measuring? You can't tell on a regular bathroom scale, you got to take a DEXA scan or some of these other scans that take a look at body composition. But some of that weight, the kind of weight that you want to lose is indeed fat. And the fat that you want to lose is visceral fat, visceral meaning guts. This is the fat that's formed inside the tube of your body. Viscera means guts. This is the fat, visceral fats, the fat around your guts. In fact, if you got a lot of visceral fat, which a lot of people do, that fat grows like a baseball glove that are cradling your organs and it becomes inflammatory, which then exposes your organs to inflammation. That's really bad. So what are the foods that have been studied to actually lower inflammatory visceral fat and help you lose weight? You might be surprised. Okay. And this is an example of the research I've done to show you can eat these foods to lose weight and lose harmful inflammatory fat. 
Okay. You ready for the first one? Yep. Navy beans out of a can that you can get the middle aisle of grocery store or out of a bag if you want to, you know, soak them overnight yourself and cook them down into, you know, like a, a bean soup or a bean stew. Well, it turns out that studies have been done at the University of Toronto looking at giving people who were a little overweight five cans of commercial white beans, like navy beans, to eat every week. Just five cans, all right? Not every day, not every meal, just five cans a week. Five cans, let's say five days out of seven days. And what they found after a month of doing this is that the men who were in the study lost an inch, one inch, out of their waist circumference. So their belt size could be tightened one inch. Listen, if you went out to buy pants, that inch could make a big difference, right? That's a, that's a completely different size of pant that you would actually go for. And when they did the body composition measurements, they found not that, that the fat that was, that was gone that led to the waist circumference, the belt loops tightening up, waist circumference shrinking is actually visceral fat went down. So less visceral fat skinnier waistline, lost some body weight, but you lost the harmful inflammatory stuff. White beans. Number two, what's another one? Strawberries. Right, wait, isn't there sugar in strawberries? Yes, there is. But there's also dietary fiber. There's also vitamin C, ascorbic acid. There's also elagic acid and anthocyanins. These bioactives activate your body's fat burning mechanisms. And in fact, they've showed that basically just having a cup and a half of ripe strawberries, all right? Go pull out a baker's measuring cup out of your kitchen and think about how many strawberries you can put in there. Not that many, um, a cup and a half of that. So take a two cupper measuring thing and just fill it up to a cup and a half with ripe strawberries. I'll tell you, number one, a great little breakfast fruit to have, all right? I would recommend getting organic because you can't wash the pesticides off the skin of a strawberry. You can't peel a strawberry. So organic is going to be better in this particular case. And organic is going to have more of the bioactive, more of the elagic acid in there. This has been well studied. The plant grown in an organic way will have much more of the bioactive that's good for your metabolism and good for lowering inflammation. And that's elagic acid. And studies have shown that people who are a little overweight that eat about a cup and a half, under two cups of strawberries a day, will actually lose harmful extra inflammatory body fat. They'll lose weight, they'll lose harmful body fat. That also works. All right, one more thing that I'll tell you that might be a surprise to lose weight is a tomato. All right, so this was a study done at the University of Portugal where they took basically normal sized students. So these are like, graduate students, you know, college students. And they enrolled these women into a, a clinical study where they gave, the only thing they did is they gave them one ripe tomato to eat an hour before lunch every day. That's it, one tomato, all right? And they no special diet, no caloric restriction, no special exercise plan, no nutrition counseling. All they did is say, here, eat this tomato and, and we're gonna measure you in the beginning, we're gonna measure you in the end. What they found is that uh, at the end of a month of doing this, the women lost a little over a pound, but they burned away a lot of body fat, visceral fat, and their waist size also shrank. So you might say, I don't know, I'm not so impressed by just losing a pound. You're right. That's not the mega loss that you might think you might want to lose, but look at it. It was just one tomato that did that. And that's the only thing. So this is an example of how, these are just three examples of what we're beginning to discover. Eating foods can activate our metabolism to burn down harmful body fat, and it works in people. Thanks so much for sharing all that. I mean, I think it's helpful for people to understand that there are foods that can definitely like help with their metabolism. And I would imagine that the opposite is also true. The thing that stops people from losing the harmful visceral fat is the fact that they're eating highly processed foods, not exercising. I mean, am I accurate? Is that what holds people back from losing it effectively? 100%. You know, the classic story is somebody who says, I want to lose some weight. I want to get healthier. I'm going to do some intermittent fasting. And it doesn't seem to work for them. Like their best friend says, well, I tried that and I lost a ton of weight. And when you go back and you talk to this individual who's having difficulty, right? And you really find out what they're doing. Number one, they might be overeating when they do eat. And when you ask them what they eat, 
the answer is sometimes when you really get down to it, this is the forensics, this is the CSI, crime scene investigation kind of thing, where you're really getting down to the nitty gritty, getting those details, and you're finding out, yeah, you know, I am having a few snacks, I'm having a bag of potato chips, or I am having ultra processed meat and a sandwich, my bologna sandwich, or I'm eating something else that is prepared, like a frozen meal that you pop in the microwave, all these things, okay, these ultra processed foods, the problem with them is that not only do they have unhealthy fats in them, including saturated fats, sometimes trans fats, even though, you know, they say that we ban trans fats, actually, here's the truth of it, beneath a certain concentration of trans fat, they can say they've got zero trans fat, but they're still laying it in there, plus many processed foods will actually have emulsifiers, other additives, artificial coloring, artificial flavoring. You ever heard like red dye, yellow number six, blue number one? Look, if you see these numbers and you're like, what the heck is that doing in my body? If you don't know, you probably don't want to be putting in your body. And by the way, the processed meat issue, I want to uh, talk about this because a lot of people don't know this. Number one, processed meats are the ones that we all grew up with. All right. I mean, come on. You got to admit. That your mom probably made you a, a the same kind of bologna sandwich or turkey sliced turkey sandwich that uh, I got too, right? And in a deli, these are with deli meats. You know that turkey slice supposedly healthy is it? It comes in a tube. It's round and it's long, like a like a cylinder. That's not how turkeys grow. I used to wonder that. Like, how the heck did they get those perfect circles out of a turkey or a ham or a bologna, which is a pig, right? And the reality is, and a lot of people don't know this, it wasn't until the 1970s when the military invented something called meat glue. You ever hear of meat glue? It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a natural substance, kind of like an amino acid-like thing that they actually can formulate, and it will bind meat together, all right? Like it's safe to eat, uh, so to speak. But what the companies were able to do, food companies were able to do, they were able then to take the cheapest remnant bits, the stuff that they would scrape off the wall, more or less, of the pig, of the turkey, of whatever, and they could pulverize the meat and the gristle and the bone into a fine powder, into basically flakes, and then add meat glue to it and stir it around, and then they can mold it into that cylinder you ever see like a big thing of salami in the deli? That thing looks like a nuclear missile. All right. And I guarantee you, porky pig does not actually come in that shape. But that is actually what processed meats are. And not surprisingly, we're beginning to find time and time and again that eating processed meats is linked to a whole series of chronic diseases, not the least of which is cancer. And I think people, they also have trouble on the liquid side too with what to eat to lose visceral fat what to eat for longevity i know you touched on obviously people cutting out soda i know you're a big fan of coffee and tea and obviously staying hydrated what are some of your favorite drinks that you think can help with people's metabolism and fat loss so this has been studied and you know i wrote about it and need to beat and I, i've been making a lot of youtube things on, on this as well. And I teach an online course on it as well. But I will tell you that there is, in, when it comes to beverages, right, there's something known as the Holy Trinity, and it has nothing to do with church. It has everything to do with the fact that there are three beverages, three legs on the stool of health that have been shown by human clinical research to be beneficial. All right. And that's water, tea, and coffee. The Holy Trinity, water, tea, and coffee. And if you have those straight, meaning you don't put artificial sweeteners, you don't actually put dairy fat into it, you don't try to doctor it up with something, those three activate your body's metabolism. You actually raise your metabolism with it. Look, I'll tell you how water works. You drink some water, all right, before a meal. A couple of things. You're stretching your stomach walls out a little bit. To so think a water balloon, you ever, when you were a kid, blown up a water balloon, take that balloon, which is really flat, flaccid, put it up to the, to the nozzle of the sink, turn on the water, all of a sudden stretches a bit in the beginning. Drink a cup of water, a glass of water before a meal, you're stretching your stomach, and that stretch of your stomach, there's something called stretch receptors. 
as your stomach stretches a bit, it tells your brain, hey, you know what? You got some food here. So we're already filling up the stomach. So let's go easy on the hunger. So you actually get full faster, which means you'll eat less. Number two, cold water. You drink cold water. I know in a lot of cultures, they're like, don't drink cold water. Only drink warm water or boiling water. But cold water actually revs up your metabolism. You know why? Because your stomach, when you drink cold water, that's pretty close to your body core. And you've heard of something called core temperature. And our bodies are designed to monitor our core temperature to make sure that we don't actually uh, fall off the cliff when it comes to our core temperature. Not too cold, not too hot, regulated completely. So when you put cold water in your stomach, your temperature sensors, your thermostat in your body basically says, ooh, we better warm things up. And so what it does is it rubs up your metabolism and you actually can burn down harmful body fat. Tea has catechins, a polyphenol, so it will turn on fat burning. And coffee has bioactives like chlorogenic acid that do as well. So these are the holy trinity that have all been shown in human studies to rev up your metabolism and help you lose harmful inflammatory visceral fat and weight loss as well. Now, obviously, nobody only consumes these beverages and not other foods. So net net, it really depends on what you're actually doing over the course of the entire day. But these three are good beverages. Some other beverages, by the way, I'll, I'll tell you that, that have been shown to improve metabolism is watermelon juice, fresh watermelon juice, not artificially flavored watermelon juice. Summertime, you get a you get some nice watermelons that are ripe. You know, you might eat some of it, but what about all the rest of it? You know what? Make it into juice. Blend that baby up. And a little bit of dietary fiber, a ton of water, which is good. But what makes watermelon red is a carotenoid, a natural bioactive called lycopene. Lycopene is anti-inflammatory. It turns on your metabolism. By the way, it's what is in those tomatoes that help those young women in Portugal actually lose that body weight and lose that body fat. That's found in watermelon juice as well. And by the way, because it's usually something you drink in the summertime, studies have shown that if you have like a tall glass of watermelon juice before, like a couple of hours before you go out to the beach, you're actually providing antioxidant activity to protect your body from ultraviolet radiation. It's like internal sunscreen that you drink. And tomato juice also is another way of getting that lycopene. But rather than get the uh, commercial tomato juice, which please look at the ingredient label. A lot of it's got added sugar. It's got preservatives. It's got all kinds of sodium benzoate. It's got all kinds of additives, thickener. You make your own tomato juice. Like if you can make a smoothie, you can make your own tomato juice and then doctor it up the way you like. You want it to be like, you know, the old vegetable, multiple vegetable juice, V8 kind of thing. You want to make it like a version Bloody Mary mix. Have fun. Go at it. Add ingredients that you know what's putting in there rather than getting it out of a can that you buy out of the grocery store. That's how you get it. But even for tomatoes, which also have its own natural sugars, you, you got to be careful about how much you drink. So I would tell you water is unlimited. Tea is unlimited. Coffee is more or less unlimited. Any other fruit juice, be careful because there are natural fruit sugars in there. You get other good stuff in it, like we talked about the lycopene and watermelon juice or tomato juice. But you'll get calories and you'll get and some of it's from the sugar and the fruit as well. And you don't want to have too much of that. Speaking of the Holy Trinity, I know you've touched on like fruits and different fruits and foods that you can eat for your metabolism and to speed up fat loss. I'd love to know, like, what are your favorite fruits, vegetables and spices that help promote overall health and longevity? Wow, there are so many. So let me pick out a couple that I like for fruits. Basically, I like most seasonal fruits, meaning I like fruits that are ripe and really delicious. I mentioned already a juicy peach. That's probably my favorite summer fruit, a juicy peach. Really good blueberries and really good strawberries are another, they follow close behind. In the fall, winter, which is pear season, I really, really enjoy a nice uh, pear as well. And, you know, pears have different amounts of liquid, different types of sweetness, different crunchiness, but I do like pears. And then in the winter, I do like citrus. A lot of people don't know this because you can get oranges all year long, but citrus like oranges, mandarins, tangerines, 
those are actually winter fruit. They're, they're actually, the winter is a season for citrus. And I, I love those, you know, peelable mandarins, the little tiny oranges, you peel off the skin, the meat comes right out. I could eat one of those and call it a day and I've gotten dietary fiber. I've gotten, I got a little hit of sweetness that I like. I've got vitamin C, I've got hesperidin, uh, but I, but very importantly, because of the amount of dietary fiber in a mandarin, a tangerine, I'm also feeding my gut microbiome. So that's a nice way of getting a hit of a, of a sweet fruit. So those are my, some of my favorite foods. I mean, there's a bunch of exotics I can talk about as well. By the way, I also like mangoes. Mangoes are absolutely delicious. They make you work for them. You got to peel them. They're kind of slippery to slice up, but they are really great. They're pretty sweet. But a lot of people don't know this, but mangoes have something bioactive in it called mangiferin. Not surprisingly, it kind of sounds a little bit like mango, but the mangiferin actually protects your body's stem cells. So it helps protect your body's ability to regenerate, which is a pretty cool uh, thing. So those are kind of like my fruits, spices. You know, spices are kind of what I call a condiment. They're an additive. They help to flavor, they enhance a food. Right. So nobody eats spice by itself, but you add it to some things. I actually I'm one of those people that actually likes spicy. So I like chili peppers or red chili flakes. I like to put them on different things. But paprika, I like paprika. I'm actually doing some research now. It turns out saffron, which is a very, very expensive spice. It's actually the pistols, the the kind of like the reproductive powder that comes from a crocus. It's used Latin cooking, whether it's Mexican or Spanish cooking, you know, if you ever had a paella, the rice is orange, but the flavor of the rice is made of saffron. Okay. And it turns out that saffron has all kinds of really nice bioactives that are good. So I love that as well. You know, another spice that people should give it a try is Sichuan peppercorns. They're not real peppers. All right. They're kind of related to peppers, but they're not really peppers, but they crush them up. And they actually give you a little zing, a little tingle in your mouth. And that tingle, by the way, activates receptors on your tongue called TRPV1, which then sends a signal to your brain to release neurotransmitters that help you burn harmful extra body fat. So, again, some people go, well, I don't really like super spicy foods. That's okay. You know, curcumin, turmeric, actually is a very, like a turmeric coffee or whatever. Th those not very strong in its flavor, but it has a lot of health potential, very super anti-inflammatory as well. Of course, basil, oregano, tarragon, rosemary, those also have their own bioactives. People say, well, how much spice should I use? How many teaspoons of oregano should I have? You shouldn't be having teaspoons of oregano. But when you're cooking something, if you think of it, add some oregano to it because you're enhancing not only the flavor, but you're enhancing the health properties of whatever food you're actually cooking the spice with. This episode is brought to you by Element. Whether or not you're working out, hydration is so important. Water alone is key, but drinking water on its own sometimes just doesn't cut it. That's where Element electrolytes come in. They have formulated a science-backed electrolyte ratio that tastes absolutely amazing. Plus doesn't have any sugar, artificial colors, or other sketchy ingredients to hold you back. I've been using Element for years, and my favorite flavor is definitely the citrus salt. I take it either first thing in the morning when I wake up or after a workout or a run. After taking it, I always feel replenished and ready to move on to the next thing I am doing. I know when I am properly hydrated, I perform and feel my best. So if you're looking to optimize your hydration, go to drinkelementt.com slash Doug Bobst to get a free sample pack with any purchase. Again, go to drinkelementt.com slash Doug Bobst or click the link below for a free sample pack with any purchase. Now back to the show. There's so many people talking about healthy foods that aren't healthy. You're hearing people say that things like vegetables aren't healthy. You're hearing people say things like oatmeal aren't healthy. What do you think are though some healthy foods that are being promoted a lot that actually aren't healthy? All right, listen, I'm a scientist. And so I'm all about the data and understanding the, the truth. That's what really science is, the pursuit of truth and discovery, like understanding how things work. I'm also a doctor, so I get asked questions all the time about, you know, like what's healthy and what's not healthy and how am I being tricked with marketing? And, you know, I, I try not to badmouth product categories, but sometimes, you know, it, it's worthwhile helping people clear up the confusion in their mind. 
All right. So I'll give you two examples, two easy ones. You ever like go on a trip and you're going to go grab some snacks and or maybe you're on, on taking an airplane and you're going to go by the, the, the convenience store and grab a healthy snack, right? Rather than grab a candy bar, you might grab one of those health bars that they actually sell as an alternative. And all of a sudden you feel like I'm doing a healthier thing, right? I mean, I don't, there, there's so many of those types of now you can pick it up. What I would say is that those health bars are not necessarily so healthy. If you pick them up and look at the ingredient label, you will see all the additives that are that are included in these so-called healthy bars. Listen, added sugar is just one component of it. If it, sugar gets vilified, our bodies actually need sugar, not too much. But the sugar that people criticize is probably the least of your problems with some of these bars. The artificial colors, the flavor enhancers, the shelf stabilizers. Look, if you were to make a little baked bar at home with you know granola or whatever it is, Guarantee you, if you made that, you keep it around your house for a couple of days and then you toss it if you don't eat it, right? These things that are found in a plastic bag or a plastic wrapper, they're sitting around for months. You know why? Because they contain chemicals that kind of embalm and mummify them. They stick around a long time. That's not what you want. So that's a kind of a healthy food that might not be so healthy. The other thing that I'll say, I find everywhere now, I, you know, again, I was doing research in the Mediterranean a few months ago. And so I was in a Mediterranean and I saw, gosh, you know, on the menu, the healthy plant-based alternative to burgers, right? So these are the plant-based meats. Okay. I'm taking a breath when I say this because I want people to really pay attention to this. Plant-based burger is not healthier than a really good burger made with high quality meat. All right. A plant-based burger is not better than a regular burger. And here's why. If you look at the ingredient label of what's in a plant-based burger, it is the epitome. It is the best example of an ultra processed food. They'll take soy. They'll actually manipulate the soy into a form where it's got the texture of meat. In order to get that texture, they add acids. They add other things to it in order to change the texture so it's meat-like. Then they'll have the flavor. You think a plant tastes like a burger? I don't think so. So now they actually add artificial ways to flavor that meat. Oh, it's smoke flavored. All right. Oh, how do you think they get that smoke flavor? That's definitely a chemical additive. And then if you're wanting to think about the ultimate in GMO, genetically modified organisms, there's some plant-based meats that actually will bleed like a burger when you cook it. You know, like remember when you're growing up and you go to like the 4th of July or picnic where somebody's grilling a burger and they like, how do you want it? You want it medium, medium rare? How do you want it? And if you were the person who's ever been manning the grill, which I used to love to man the grill, you're cooking it, you press down on the burger and a little blood will come out, like little red stuff. Well, plant-based burgers have been genetically engineered to bleed like that. So how do they do it? They take the gene for plant hemoglobin, which is the a protein that's found in blood, and they genetically engineer it into soy, all right? So forget about like, you know, the big soy companies. Now you're actually particularly genetically engineered it to make the plant-based burger bleed like a real burger. So after all this is said and done, you're still griddling it with the same greasy stuff that you're using a regular burger. But instead of a piece of meat, I'm not telling people to eat regular meat as a regular habit, but hamburgers as a regular habit. I'm just telling you that plant-based burgers, which are touted to be a healthier option, are in fact an ultra-processed food. I put them in the same basket as potato chips and all these other ultra-processed foods, maybe a little bit less worrisome than a Twinkie or whatever, but you know, it, it, I would say it's not a healthy choice to make. If you love the flavor and you're a vegetarian or a vegan, enjoy it once in a while, but don't mistake that for a healthy food, even though it's sometimes marketed as a healthier choice. Thanks so much for sharing all that. I mean, I think people do need to focus on like whole unprocessed foods. And I agree. I think plant-based burgers are super unhealthy in my opinion as well. Eating for longevity in health, you recommend people eating like a plant, I guess, forward plant-based diet. You know, what types of foods would you say are best to include 
in a diet like that? Like where, where do you recommend people get their protein from? So let me, again, start with what I do. And maybe this is a good guide going forward for other people. Because, you know, like this is, look, I could lecture about, you know, the ideal ways of eating. But at the end of the day, people ask me, hey, Dr. Lee, how do you eat? Like, what's their approach? Number one, I'll tell you what I do. I really try to avoid eating fast food. Uh, you know, the drive throughs all that kind of stuff, convenience stuff. Even if I'm on a car trip, you know, like a road trip, I try to avoid eating that kind of stuff because that's just ultra more ultra processed stuff with unhealthy fats, a lot of salt, and I'm not controlling any of it. And I'm eating it on the go as well and eating it too quickly. So I try to avoid all that kind of stuff. I try to eat foods that I cook myself, all right, or that somebody has cooked for me so that I know what's in it and I know what the quality of the food that's in it. So then you ask, well, like, okay, so what kind of foods do you actually have? I will tell you right up front, although I do eat salads, I'm not like a big fan of the typical garden salad, all right? It's my least favorite thing when it comes to plant-based foods. So for anybody listening, you want to join me, you know, on, on a healthier diet, don't worry. You don't need to eat salads all the time. I like I like foods that are cooked. So I like cooked tomatoes. Think about tomato sauce. I like mushrooms. I like spinach. Like if you cook the spinach, you know, one of my favorite spinach dishes, something I learned from the Mediterranean, you take clean spinach, take some extra virgin olive oil. It's got all these polyphenols in it that are good for your overall health and lower inflammation. Chop up some garlic that have allicin, also good for lowering inflammation. Saute the garlic in the extra virgin olive oil. It smells really good. Throw in the spinach. A lot of spinach will shrink down. Just kind of stir that around, saute it. It cooks really fast. Like I'm talking about maybe a minute and a half max. Throw in some pine nuts, throw toasted pine nuts, some golden raisins. You want to put a little chili pepper flakes, take it off the heat and serve it. And now you've got this incredible, delicious Spanish style, the spinach dish that's not only good for your microbiome, not only anti-inflammatory, but it actually helps to lower your blood pressure as well because the nitrogen in spinach, if you chew it, and that's a dish that I really savor, will actually be converted. The nitrogen from the spinach will be converted into a form, gets absorbed in your stomach as nitric oxide, which lowers your blood pressure and improves your blood flow as well. So, you know, I liked cooked vegetables. I was looking the, just the other day at a dish of kind of sweet and sour, they call it agrodolce, radicchio. Now, radicchio is a vegetable that if you don't know to look for it, you might miss it. It's a fall vegetable that it's kind of red and white. It's a vegetable it's in the leafy section. It's not green that you can actually roast and you can add apple cider vinegar to it. You get an extra virgin olive oil to it. You can also grill it and it's absolutely delicious. And so I like to plan my meals inside out of how we were taught, right? So most meal planning goes, okay, what do you want for your protein? You want chicken, you want fish, you want beef or whatever. And you start with that. And then like, what do you want on your side? Because that's how the restaurants have it. What do you want for a side dish? What kind of vegetables do you want your side fish? I like to invert that. I say, what do I want as my vegetable, which would be my main. And then if I want to actually have a non-plant-based protein on the side, it's a side dish. And if it's a side dish, I want to make it so I can share it with everybody, whether it's fish, poultry, you know, whatever it is, I want it to be shared with everyone. And that's another little tip is cook foods that are classic in traditional Asian or Mediterranean. I tell people I eat Mediterranean style, Mediterranean and Asian. Either way, I can swing either way. I can mix them together. But those tend to actually be made from the healthiest fresh ingredients or fermented ingredients as well, which can be really great for gut health, good for overall health defenses, good for your metabolism, and also help you live longer and better. Thanks so much for sharing that. That sounds like a delicious way to live and to eat. I want to talk about the opposite really quick, where I think people, they're looking for answers and they want to know, like, is it time to shift my diet? Is it time to go to the doctor? Is it time to start exercising? And obviously the answer is always yes, but what are some of the signs that somebody has poor health and is decreasing their lifespan? Yeah, you know what? One that I'm doing research on right now, it's really important because we all can get this way. If you feel tired and you're dragging all the time, all right, you know something's not right when you feel like 
you don't have any energy. And all you want to do is kind of lie down. Now, you might actually have a real illness. You like, you could be really sick. You could have diabetes. You could have heart disease. Your gut health might be bad and you might have inflammation. Inflammation makes you tired. That's one of the things that we do know for chronic fatigue syndrome, which is not a well-known like we don't quite understand chronic fatigue very well, but we do know that inflammation goes like through the roof when you're actually chronically fatigued. And when you're chronically inflamed, you're also tend to be tired. So fatigue is one of them. This is not something that most people talk about, but I'm a doctor, so I can I tell this to people all the time. Look in the toilet bowl after you urinate, after you pee. Does that look normal? Is it clear? Is it light yellow? Uh, it should be. If it's dark, hey, you know, you're a little dehydrated, better catch up with that fluid. All right. That's a quick, easy visual test. And also after you go do number two, listen, we now know our gut health is responsible for lowering inflammation, raising our immune system to defend ourselves against invaders from outside the body and even cancer cells invader inside the body. And also our gut health is responsible for our metabolism, responsible for internal healing and responsible for brain health. When your gut is not healthy and when it produces poop that isn't normal, loose stools all the time, constipation all the time, dark, tarry stools, bright red blood in your stool, any of those kinds of things that are not normal, that's a signal that things are not going well with your gut and your gut health is probably compromised. That's another wake up call that you should be doing something. And look, how many of us have actually just muscled through, soldiered through being kind of uncomfortable in our belly, right? Yeah, you know, I don't know. My gut's not feeling that great today. And tomorrow to feel better. I'm going to just muscle through that. Listen, that day that your gut's not doing too well, it's your body giving a signal, sending up a distress flare. Something is actually going on. And th these are all subtle signs, but they're important signs that it's time for you to slow down and take a moment to take a look at your health and what you can do to improve it. Take out a piece of paper that you can put on the refrigerator magnet and just write down the date and what you're feeling and, and do that for a week to see if you're actually feeling uncomfortable for at least a few days, maybe a week. So you're documenting what you're feeling. All right. That's important because by the time you go to the doctor, yeah, you know, like, oh, why are you here? Well, my stomach was uncomfortable five days ago, but actually feels fine now. We don't know what actually was going on. But if you tell me uh, for three days straight, I was having, you know, a diarrhea, you know, like, OK, now now the doctor will see you. Well, actually start to put together a more detailed picture. Take a note of it. You know, easy thing is on your phone, your mobile phone. Op flip open the notes program app. Take some notes. All right. You can delete it later if you're embarrassed by it. But do take those notes down, because when you t t talk to the doctor, they're going to ask you. People like me are going to say, well, when did this begin and how long did it begin? And have you had any other signs or symptoms where you're feeling weird? Write all that down. If you can give me three or four days or five days of a report, man, is that helpful for us to figure out. And so that's what I encourage people to do rather than at the first sign call up your doctor to go to an appointment or go to the emergency room. No, you don't need to do that. Slow it down. Pay attention. There's a warning sign going on. Take some notes because you're going to want to share that with your doctor later. When it comes to like taking that first step to improve your health, like do you think exercise or nutrition matters more? Both. They go hand in hand. You know, when you exercise, you know, like, okay, so a lot of people think of exercise as, you know, going to Pilates or, or going to a gym, that is exercise or weightlifting, that is exercise. But, you know, actually walking up the stairs, choosing the stairs instead of the elevator, or the escalator, that's, that's exercise as well. So we do little bits of exercise every single day. If you live in an apartment building and you want to walk at two or three flights up to your apartment, hey, that's also exercise. Walking to school, you know, even if you work in an office building, you know, even going to pick up something rather than have somebody deliver to you, that's all exercise. So I think that exercise is very natural to do. And it's a good thing to think about, oh, the easiest way is actually just to go for a walk. Anybody, I don't care how busy you are. I don't care if you're the, you know, if you're the president or CEO of a whatever, 
listen, you got time, but trust me, you've got time after dinner to go for a 30 minute walk to get your heart rate up, get that blood flowing and that you to help digest your food and give, it'll set you up to have better sleep anyway. All right. Th these are all little tiny signs. No time for a gym, can't afford the gym membership, no problem. There's a low cost way of getting started. And of course you can ramp it up. I think for most people who are struggling with this question, the question is how do I get started? And that's how you get started. Well, Dr. Lee, it's always a pleasure to speak with you. And I think the audience is gonna get a tremendous amount of value out of this conversation like they always do. So I wanted to thank you once again for your time. Thanks, Doug. I, you know, thanks for having me on. I really enjoy our conversations. We're always poking at things that I think a lot of people are wondering about, but they're not really sure how they should begin. And that's really why I started to talk about, let me show you how I do it, uh, uh, because that way people can relate to things. Let's start with if you don't know how to do something or you haven't started yet, what's the first baby steps you can actually take? Well, awesome. Thank you once again for coming on. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, I really think you're going to like this video as well. I'll see you there.